Hi. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Um, so yeah, I'm Larry Zerner. Um, I'm an attorney. I've been an attorney uh, 20, 26 years. Uh, <laughs> um, I started out as an actor, uh, did stand-up, uh, so I, I understand that life. Uh, left that because, you know, it's hard to make a living. Uh, moved into law. Um, have my own firm in Century City. I just handle entertainment, copyright, trademark issues. Um, this is a talk that I've been giving in various formats for about 10 years. I've given it, I've given it here, I've given it to the Pitch Fest, the creative screenwriting, uh, various play, writing groups around the country. So yeah, so in my, my practice I handle, I do contracts for, I represent only talent, never studios, I rep, and I do, you know. How uh, much per hour? <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll talk. Uh, and uh, so I do contracts, and I do also do litigation. Uh, I know Jeff because I represented Jeff in a lawsuit uh, 10 years ago. And this is the Playwrights Foundation. I've talked to screenwriting groups. I, you know, you guys are all writers. Uh, you're writing plays and movies I, and TV. Your things so all try and broaden the scope of this talk a little bit to, to be a little more general. Then the first thing I was I was going to talk about in terms of is because what the point of this talk is to help you guys understand, you know, how to protect your work, how not to get ripped off, and how not to get sued um, by other people. If you know, if you're from collaborators to, uh, or if you're sub the subject of your show, if you're doing a show about a real person. So we'll do a bunch of, uh, we'll cover a bunch of areas. Um, first thing we'll talk about is is who owns the work that you create, because uh, it's a different thing for in the playwriting world and the screenwriting world. Um, uh, when we talk about copyright, copyright exists at the moment of creation. At the moment you write, you put pen to paper, the moment it, it's on your computer and you hit save, you own the copyright in that. But in general, if you write a movie and you sell it, you're no longer going to own it. The studio's going to own it. And if you, but if you write a play, generally you do own it. Uh, and the playwriting rules are a little different in that the writer could, will usually control it even though a producer will come in and uh, that's something, if you ever sell your play, you got to make sure that, you know, the producer may have some piece of it, but you, it is your control thing. Whereas in a movie world, you will not have that control. You, you just, you, you know, until you build up a little, um, yeah, yeah, until you're a bit, little bigger. But, um, and especially if you're a playwright and you're making a deal and someone's doing your play, you want to uh, make sure that, um, you own, you continue to own it, and even though people add to it, so when you make deals with the director, when you make deals with the act, uh, with the uh, choreographer or anything, maybe not the choreographer who, who may own this, their own choreography, and so if you do a separate production, you have to get a different choreographer or, or have a right to that choreography. Um, but uh, the but if the, the direction especially, you want to say, you don't want the director, because the director's going to come in there and, you know, change things, move things around, add things. But typically, the writer still owns the copyright to the work, and the director does not. The director may, sometimes the director, and you can make that deal with the director, that you still own the copyright. You still own what he adds to the show. He's, he can add to the show, but you, you own what he does. You're the one in control of that. Um, that's on a play. On a movie, you're not going to have any, <laughs> any control over anything until you get to be another. When, you, when you're just starting out and you sell a movie, right, they're just going to say, we own it. We own everything. That's it. Unless, you know, you can get some, I mean, depending also on the budget of the movie and if you're, um, because, and we'll get to selling rights and, and, and getting in there. And there was an interesting case a few years ago involving the musical Rent. Um, where uh, Jonathan Larson, who wrote it, and as you may know, died the day the show opened. Um, uh, and he, 
he had a little trouble writing. They were actually were working on the show for years and, and writing it, and they hired a dramaturge to help him with the show. Who, and the dramaturge worked with him a lot and, and, and really added dialogue, wrote dialogue, changed the show. A lot of the show was this dramaturge. And so after the show was a big hit, the, the dramaturge sued the Larson family, because he was gone, and said, hey, I want a piece of that, because I wrote that, and that's mine. And so she wanted 16% of the show, which was a half of a third, because that's what she... And um, uh, that went to trial, and the, under, under copyright rules, the question is whether she was considered a joint author. And under copyright rules, the, the, the basic rule is you're only a joint author if is if both parties think that you're a joint author. So if you're working together with someone, you sort of know, you, you know, and they're both writers and you thing. But in the case of Jonathan Larson, even though they had worked on it, Jonathan Larson always took, he, it said, written by Jonathan Larson. He never, he, he appreciated her contribution, but he never credited her as the writer. And it, it, is, it is certainly, everyone believes that had he been alive, he would have given her a piece of the show, but because he wasn't, the judge finally ruled there was no evidence that he considered her to be a co-author, and so therefore she wasn't a co-author. But it's something to keep in mind that when you're working with people, you want to make sure that th these things are delineated. Uh, in fact, an interesting side note of the show Rent was that, and I didn't know this till today when I was researching this case, um, it actually was someone else's idea. Uh, and that person had worked with, got together with Jonathan Larson, they started working on it, and they worked on it for a few years, and then that guy dropped out of the project, and he said, I'm out, you can keep going, and, and, and in exchange, I get 4% of the show, and Jonathan Larson said, okay, and so they made that deal, and that guy's no one knows his name, but he owns 4% of rent, which I assume means he doesn't have to work anymore. Um, so, some, well, well, so rent is based on Puccini, uh, La Boheme. Yeah, so it's not, he doesn't get a credit on the show, but... It would be nice if they say inspired by it. I, But everyone knows, I mean, they don't hide that. They do say that it is inspired. So I, I don't know. It's I think I don't know if you saw the program whether it would say that, um, but I, I I certainly knew that, and I think most people who are aware of um, that know. So we we are talking about copyright and and protecting your work, and so that's so important. And we even though you own the copyright um, at the moment of inception, it's important to register the work. And we always get the question, where do I register it? Because there's the WGA and there's the Copyright Office, and does anybody register with the WGA? Okay, does anybody register with the Copyright Office? Okay, all right, so here's the, 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 the quick answer. The WGA is worthless. It, I, I, it, if I, I could do one thing in this world, I would get rid of that WGA registration, because they make you think that it does you some good, and it doesn't. It's just, it, it, at one point, 20 years ago, it maybe had an easy way to get your stuff, some evidence of your, of your thing, but now that we're online, it, it gives you less than no protection. Um, and and the, the reasons that you need to file a co with the Copyright Office are, so uh, number one, if, you're, if you have to sue somebody, it's required that you had filed with the Copyright Office. You have to. Um, number two is, by filing with a copyright office, it is considered evidence, prima facie evidence, that, that you own it because you filed the copyright office, which is very important if there's a lawsuit because sometimes it's hard to prove you own works. Now, just to, I had a case with, some, with, with Jeff involving a, uh, a, something he had written 20 years before. And we had to prove that he wrote it. And there weren't any computer disks that existed. And had he registered it with the Copyright Office, this wouldn't be an issue. Because we would have just, 
thing, uh, we would have just gone, okay, there's the copyright registration, case closed. But because we didn't have that, we had to go track down the people who were in, who had read the book 20 years before and go, do you remember reading this book? And that's literally how we had to prove it. That's not a, a thing you want to have to do. So having a registration is, 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 is key is to getting that proof. The, the other thing is, if you file a lawsuit, you only get your attorney's fees in that lawsuit for copyright infringement if you registered before the infringement began. So that, that's always, and, and, and in, in the law, the infringement begins so, because people go, oh, I hear the movie's coming out. Oh, and I think that's mine, so I'll register now. Movie hasn't come out yet. But that's not, when the, that's not when the infringement began. The infringement began when they made the movie, right? When they, where they wrote the script that they're using for that movie. So it's important because attorney's fees sometimes drive these lawsuits. Um, the other thing is there's a provision in the copyright law that allows for what's called statutory damages. So normally in a copyright infringement case, you can get your actual damages, which are, which is, let's say, let's say someone made a movie of, of your script without paying you, right? So your damages are um, the money you would have been paid for that script, right? That's one thing. You also are entitled to their, their profits. Well, they may not have any profits. They actually not, and you're not entitled to all the profits, you're only entitled to the profits that are attributable to the script, so that's a smaller portion. And most movies don't make profits. So let's say someone may, sold your, stole your script and made some low budget movie and it came out and you wanted to sue and you hadn't registered it. Well, your damages are, you know, what would you have been paid for that? Well, you know, 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand? Well, it's hard to do a lawsuit when that's the amount of money at stake. But if you registered it with the copyright office and then you want to hire a lawyer, now you get your attorney's fees and the other side knows you get your attorney's fees. So they're like, oh, now this thing that where I have to pay money, I may have to pay an attorney, my own attorney and the other side's attorney. So that doubles everything. So that changes the analysis. And then there's this thing, statutory damages, which a jury can award up to $150,000 if they find that there was willful infringement. You don't have to prove any extra actual damages. The jury can just say up to $150,000. So in a case where a movie doesn't really make any money, uh, but it got a wide release, it doesn't make money because they spent a lot of money, right? They spent, they spent $70 million on it and it made $50 million, okay. Well, I should get a big chunk of that, but they don't have that, so at least I can get the court, I get a jury to give me $150,000, if anything, if I can't get something. Um, the other thing is copyright registration will last until 70 years after you die, <laughs> which is a long time, long time. Whereas the, the WGA registration, you know how long that lasts? Five years, and then done. Um, and if, it, you can renew it, but if you remember, and uh, Jeff had re re registered it with the copyright, with the WGA, uh, that, that thing, but he hadn't renewed it because who remembers to renew it? So one time, 70 years after, so you never have to think about it again. Um, uh, you can file it online. It's very simple. Uh, it costs $35. So if there's, if there's one thing that you, you know, before you send your, and so before you send your work out to other people, that's when you need to, to register it. And people say, well, what if, if I make changes, do I need to re-register it? And so the, the answer to that question is, you should re-register if you've made significant changes to it, where you think, yeah, there's enough changes here that um, I think I need to get a, a, you know, I want to protect that, the new stuff. If, if it's just like, I'm tweaking some words here and there and, and making minor changes, then no, you don't, you don't really need to. Um, and when you do, when you go on, if you, if, you, if you don't know how to register with the Copyright Office, I actually have a video uh, on YouTube, just look for uh, Zerner Law, it'll come up, or how to register with the Copyright Office, it walks you through the process. It's on the New Playwrights Foundation YouTube channel. It's 
on over new. Oh, there you go. And it walks you through it. And uh, so uh, you can uh, see how to, to register it, and uh, then you'll be, it's easy. Yeah? Do you, if you adapt a screenplay from a novel that you wrote, yeah. do you need to two separate copyrights? Yeah. Well, you don't. I mean, if, as, if. Are they two separate entities? Yeah. They are, and yeah, you should. I mean, if you're selling the book and you're selling the, the script, yeah, you should register the um, thing. And, and when you, when you uh, fill out the, the registration, so you already have a registration for the novel, and then you fill the registration for, for the script, it'll say, is there a pre-existing registration? You know, is this based on a pre-existing work or pre-existing written? You'll say yes, and it'll ask you the number, and you'll put down that number, and you'll go, what is the difference between that and this? And you'll say, oh, I turned the novel into a screenplay. <laughs> um, there's no, people talk about the poor man's copyright, right? you know, mailing it to yourself. Uh, that's just an urban myth. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is not exist. There is no such thing. I, I, there is no case ever where some guy walked into court with an envelope with a postmark on it, and he opened it up and he said, look, here's my script. That's just not how it works. Never happened. It's... No. Um, I, 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 although, I, I mean, this is, this is I, here's, if, if, I mean, if you, the, the one thing you could do, like if, if you're just, the point is to prove, uh, sometimes, uh, you're, the, you're the defendant in a case. You get sued, right? Someone who sues you for copyright infringement. And it's something that you never put out, you never registered because you never actually finished it. So you're like, I don't even know, you know, I, I didn't. So if you're just, if the issue is, is proving that I created this by, at an earlier date, one thing you can do is like using Gmail or some other thing, you know, email it to yourself because that's evidence that is, right, you can't really fake that. You can see there's an email, here's the attachment, this is what it is, and you can, that's, and, and in fact, I tell people when they register it with the copyright office, that, because you upload that copy uh, to, to them, and so you want to, you want to know that the cop, because your copy could, is on your computer, your computer could crash, you could lose it, you might make changes to it. What I tell people is to, the, at, as soon as they re register it, email it to yourself through Gmail or Yahoo or something, or, you know, something that's going to stay stick around for many years. And, and send an email to yourself. This is the script that I upload to the copyright office on this day. And then, if you ever, because you can't get the one in Washington, that's, it's up in Washington, you'll never, it's, it's a, it, it costs $100 to get it. <laughs> but this way, it's an easy way to go, okay, now I know this is the one I have. If your computer ever, if you ever lose your computer, you know you have that script. So that, that's, a, that's a way to keep, uh, to keep that around. I, I get lots of calls from people who go, you know, I wrote this, and now I see there's a show coming out, and it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And, you know, 99% of the time, you know, yeah, because there's only so many ideas. I mean, I just had a guy call me, and, and he's like, I wrote this thing about a young person who's in a retirement. He, lived, he moved into a retirement home, or, you know, with a bunch of old people. I'm like, all right, it's a cute idea. But it's not like the, that's not the most original idea of the world. And, <laughs> And he's like, and then I heard like Norman Lear's coming out with that show. And he's like, he stole it from me. And I'm like, no, he didn't. Like, that's like just there. Like, you, could, you can see that that idea is just in the ether, right? You don't have to be like, you're like, okay, that's a good idea, but it's not like, right? That's what's happening because lots of, lot of, we are the baby boomers are aging and the young people are going there. And I see where that comes from. And it turns out there was a show five years ago that had the same premise, I mean, or 10 years ago. When we talk about, uh, copyright infringement, it's not about the same idea. It's about, it's the, the test for copyright inf infringement is what we call substantial similarity, which means uh, um, there's similarity of plot, characters, dialogue, theme, setting, and sequence of events. 
That's what the court looks like, all those factors. And um, unfortunately, in the, we're in the Ninth Circuit here. We have a very, very studio-friendly um, uh, yes, they're very, <laughs> they're very studio friendly. And they require this level of similarity that I think is, and most lawyers who do what I do, think is way higher than, like they don't even let it go to a jury. Like, I mean, there, I've seen cases where, boy, there's a lot of similarities about, um, uh, it's very specific stuff. There was a case involving, um, my Name is Earl. Remember that show, My Name is Earl? Which had a very specific plot, right? That's not a, a show about a uh, you know, retirement thing. It was about a guy who, who um, won the lottery, he was a bad guy, and then, he, um, and then he, got, he gets hit by a car and he decides to go make amends. And there was a guy who wrote a script that had the exact, exact same premise, and that is a specific premise. And in, in, in his script, in the first script, uh, the, he had a best friend whose name was uh, Lobster Boy, and in My Name is Earl, the guy's best friend was named Shrimp. I mean, it was like, really, like, like really? Thing. And the court was like, yeah, this one, but this one's a drama, and that one's a half-hour sitcom, and I'm not even going to, won't even let it go to a jury. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it, now, if you have a case and you think that, hey, there's this stuff here, you know, that's what I do, give me a call, and I'll, and I'll tell you if I think there's enough there, but um, but that's what they look at, and, and also if they look at, so if you're doing a movie about a true event, and, and you should know this too, that because you don't need to be afraid, because you're like, oh, I'm working on a script, oh, and there's that, that thing came out, now am I going to get sued? First of all, when people go, am I going to get sued because there's some movie came out, but I already wrote my script, no, because unlike patent or trademark, Copyright uh, uh, only protects people from copying you. If, you. if two people independently create the exact same thing, even if it is verbatim, you know, by some thing, yeah. Uh, but you can have that in songs, you were, you know, because it's limited. But if you had verbatim, if, if you can prove it was independently created, there is no, uh, there's no claim there. Um, uh, and, um, if you're writing uh, uh, about a true event, um, you can't protect the facts that are in that event. So, you know, if you're going to write, write your own movie about the Titanic, well, you're going to have a lot of stuff in there that would also have been in the movie Titanic, right? Because the, the ship, went, you know, the ship did certain things. You know, if you had Rose and Jack and the, and the <laughs> diamond and all that, that would be, you know, that's where you get into infringement territory because that's all the made-up stuff. But no infringement of fact, and you don't. And and there's what we call in um, uh, scenes affair. That's the you know I don't know it's French, but you know it's like the thing where it's just, which is these are the things that are standard in that type of show. So if you're doing a vampire movie, right, you're going to have crosses and, uh, and and bats and garlic and stakes in the heart, you know, because that's the the, the tropes of a vampire movie, or if you have a if you're gonna have a, a cop movie, you're gonna have you know uh, shootouts and car chases and the 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 lieutenant who's like you're crossing the line one too many times, you know it's like that, right? Those are all the things that are what we call scenes of fair, and so it's the other stuff. So if, when you're um, if you see other if you see stuff out there and you want to make a movie, don't be afraid just because it has the this, the, the same thing. I mean, some examples of this, um, we had, uh, if you remember, um, uh, there were two movies a couple years ago. Um, one was uh, uh, Olympus Has Fallen, and the other one is, was White House Down, right? Both of the exact same plot, right? The, uh, the terrorists take over the White House, and, and there's a rogue uh, Secret Service agent who has to rescue the president. I mean, it was the exact same plot. They both came out. Right, both independently created. Uh, Armageddon and Deep Impact came out at the same time, which were both about a meteor coming to crash in the U.S. Uh, we've seen many movies, you know, we call body switching movies, right? Where parent, like Freaky Friday, um, 
uh, and uh, the change up and 18 again where you know parents switch places with their kids or with their grand you know and that so those are those are ideas that anyone can use and you don't need to worry about oh it's the same idea don't you know you can you can you can say I like that idea I'm gonna do my own uh, take on that well there there is a company called asylum which they're, they make lots of movies, uh, very low budget movies, and their whole business model is seeing what's coming out and making a similar movie to get, and, and their goal is that you will go to Redbox. So they, they'll make a movie called The Hated Eight, right? And you'll go to Redbox because most people are not like <laughs> plugged in. I mean, here in LA, we're plugged in. But if you're like in, Nebraska, and you're like, oh, hey, today, yeah, that's the Tarantino movie, and they'll rent it by mistake. And they, that's, that's their whole business model. When, I remember when Battle Los Angeles came out, they had a movie called Battle for Los Angeles, right? Because anyone could do aliens battling in LA, right? So, that, so that's their whole thing. Again, they, they take a similar title, and, uh, and we'll talk about titles a little bit later, uh, and, and, the same, and, a, and the same premise and make a movie, and they're, they're, that's their goal, and you can do that too. I mean, sometimes people go, uh, oh, I had this movie coming out, and, and, and uh, you know, I had this script, it's a great script, and now I see this, someone else has taken, you know, that someone, there's a movie coming out, uh, you know, with that same idea. Scorsese's doing that same idea, and I go, okay, well, that just means the idea is good. Now you can go sell your, your, your thing, because someone maybe wants it, because you can see, like, with Olympus Has Fallen, and and, and White House Down, that didn't stop Hollywood from making the second movie. They both knew it. Uh, they both knew that the other one was coming. It didn't stop them. You can, sometimes people will, it'll, 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 you can use that as a way, look, I, I had a script already written. It's ready to go. Let, let, like, you can make, go make that movie. You could, so you can use that to, 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 as a, you know, life hands your lemons, make lemonade, so. Um, uh, so that's that's thing, and then um, we talk. So and then parody is its own thing, and especially in there's been a few cases lately involving plays and parody. Uh, one a few years ago involving uh, a, a playwright wrote a, a, a parody of Three's Company, uh, where he sort of um, updated it and you know try and put it in present day. The sort of the you know the idea of a, you know a guy pretending to be gay. Uh, with two roommates, and the, the guy who created Three's Company sued him, um, and, uh, and the court ruled in favor of the playwright uh, and said it was a parody and, and therefore okay. And, and last year there was a case involving a parody of How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Uh, and again, the, the, the court looked at that. And, and so parody is protected um, as long as, but it's clear, it, in parody, the difference between parody and satire, parody makes fun of the thing that is the subject, the, the, the underlying work. Parody makes fun of the underlying work. Satire will take an underlying work to then make fun of something else. Um, uh, so there have been, uh, there was another one where someone took, uh, it was a, a Dr. Seuss version of Star Trek and, and and the court said, okay, that's not a parody because you're not really making fun of Dr. Seuss. You're just using Dr. Seuss to, to you may be making fun of Star Trek, but you weren't making fun of Dr. Seuss and it took too much of Dr. Seuss. So there's a line, but parody is, your Mad Magazine is parody, right? If you grew up watching, reading Mad Magazine, that's parody, that here we're just making fun of the thing in there. I'm gonna go back to Olympus Has Fallen because I, I happen to know that there was a lawsuit over Olympus Has Fallen, uh, that's the, 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 where the White House was taken over, because that was written with two people, and then one of the guys took it and sold it, <laughs> and didn't credit the other guy, and didn't pay the other guy, and so the other guy sued him and ended up getting paid, like he had, he had, to, turn over, he had to turn over half the money he got. Now, it's not, Here's the thing, technically, you can't sue 
your co-author for copyright infringement because he owns the copyright too. So he didn't, they, they're, in those cases, they're not, she's not infringing the copyright. She's violating the implied agreement that, hey, we're 50-50 partners on this. And if you sell it, you're going to give me half the money. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, dealing with partners in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's key that um, uh, that is something to, to, to think about when you're working with someone, should you have a written agreement uh, to, to deal with that. Um, uh, in fact, or we can just move on to that because um, if you're dealing with a partner, you should, even if you don't want to have a formal contract, you should at least have like something where you go, this is what our deal is. Like, especially if it's not going to be 50-50, uh, you definitely want that in writing uh, because somehow uh, it, people forget. Uh, I, I worked on a, a documentary, I, I, did a, I, did, I was doing the legal for a documentary, uh, with three friends, and I was friends with them, and I, they had been friends for a long time, and they're working together on this documentary, and, I, and then I'm doing the legal, and they're like, okay, we're going to be, it's one-third, 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 great, okay, fine, let me write that up, and like, we'll get there, we'll get there. They shoot the whole thing. I'm like, let me write that up. We'll get there. We'll get there. Finish the thing. One of the guys said, okay, I get half. You guys get 25% each. And he had the footage. And just screwed them out of their money. And, you know, be, you know it's like, these were good friends. They were good friends. And, like, it's not, you know, even if you have to, uh, like, like if you don't want to like do the I have a contract thing, like send an email. It's like just want to confirm like this is this is what we're doing. Like so these are the, these are the issues, right? Like, like like you know. So you want to talk about you know what is the money split? That's obviously. I think that it's good to sort of talk about how that you know how you're going to write. I mean, sometimes people write together in a room, and sometimes people get together break it up and go, okay, you write that scene, I'll write this scene, and then we'll get back together, and, or we'll just trade them and, and do that, right? But you sort of want to talk about that so people have a, a good expectation about how it's going to be. Um, who owns the idea? You want to sort of talk about, like, if in the, in the rent case, that, that one guy had come to Jonathan Larson and with the idea um, of doing uh, La Boheme, uh, a modern-day La Boheme, that was his idea. So... Um, and then that's why he was able to like go, okay, I get 4%. Um, so you sort of want to say like, it, and it, like, especially if you come to someone with your great idea, like, yeah. oh, I got this great idea. And then you, you sort of want to go, okay, if this, but you know, you work with someone and we've all done it, right? And then sometimes it just doesn't work. You know, it's just, you're, you're, not, you're not jiving, you're not jiving anymore. Um, so you want to make sure that they can't, if it's not, it doesn't work, you're not going to take my idea. Like, this is my idea. Uh, and, and you won't use it. The other thing, one, another thing you, you want to uh, talk about um, before you start is whose name goes first on the credits. Now, okay, I, someone just sent me a thing like last week where they were mad that the other person had registered it with a copyright office and put the other person's name first and, okay, here's my legal thing on credit. The only person who cares about whose name is first is your mother. Yeah. That's it. Nobody else cares. Nobody went, that Paul McCartney, his name's always second. It's always John Lennon first. That guy, McCartney, sucks. Nobody ever had that thing. Nobody ever said, that Hammerstein guy, <laughs> it's all Rogers. Right? It does Rogers was the guy, Hammerstein. Like, it, nobody has that thought, except when it's you, you're like, why the hell is him? So just flip a coin or agree. But, and, 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 and frankly, if you're a team, it's better to keep the same order all the time because it, become it becomes a, um, a, a thing, like Lennon and McCartney, Rogers and Hammerstein. It's good to be a, like, always that way. So, or if one name just sounds better, first, do it that way. 
It doesn't matter legally. It does, nobody thinks worse of you because your name is second. Another point to think about when you're working with someone is who has the, how do you, who is the say on the deal? If you're, so you, you've written something and then someone wants it. Someone wants it. Uh, uh, someone wants to buy it or someone wants to option it. And you're like, great. And the other person's like, no, we're, that's, that, that's, that's, we're not getting enough money. That, that's the wrong person. That's just, no, I'm not selling it to that person, right? Who is it? So how do you, dev how do you decide those issues? And that's something to think about before you get there, right? It's, in essence, a collaboration agreement is like a, 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 a prenup for writers, right? You're trying to think about what are the issues that could happen and how do we resolve them? So, if, you know, if you come to that kind of impasse and you can't come to a, a resolution, um, you know, do you flip a coin? Do you go to ask, do you ask someone else? Um, if you have a real problem with someone, and you want a fairly low, inexpensive way to resolve it, um, I, just for your edification. There's a group in Santa Monica, it's called California Lawyers for the Arts, um, and they run um, a mediation service. Uh, for $150, you get three hours with two attorneys who will act as a mediator for your dispute, which is a great deal. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, I've been on that panel, I've done that. So, uh, so you get someone like me to sort of thing and, and, and try and work it out. So there's, there, there are groups like this that will help and, and you know, people who know. Um, so that's, some, but so when you're, when you're working with someone, these are things to think about and you know, hopefully write them down <laughs> and go, okay, this is what the money split is this, and I own the idea, and if we have a dispute, this is how we're going to resolve it. Um, uh, if you can't, if, 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 you have, if you don't have a contract, but you've talked about it, like if you go, like, let's have a talk, or you know, like, like you're, you know, you, you just had to talk with me. So then you go to your partner and go, you know, Larry, I just met this guy, Larry, and he had these things, and he said we should talk about this, and you go, any, anything. And then you can send an email and go, okay, this is what we agreed. Like, we agreed to, I, it's 50 50, and we agreed this, and we agreed this, and we agreed this. Like, is this right? Like, so you send an email to them, and you go, is this right that this is what we agreed? And if they don't respond back to you, that's evidence of, of acquiescence in court. Like, I sent them an email and said, is this right? Like, like you go, if, it's not, if this is not correct, let me know. Like, if you think there's something else, let me know. If you send that email to someone and they don't respond back to you, a judge will look at that as some evidence. I mean, obviously, it's better to have a signature, but an email like that, it can be good evidence. Um, but again, if you're sending a, a, an email, it's great to put, like, at the bottom of it, it, you know, if you think this is not right, let me know. Right, because that's where you sort of like. I'm not. It's not like I'm not forcing you to respond, but if they don't, that's evidence in court that they sort of you sent it to them and they didn't complain. So that's probably the deal. That be at least. You've all heard the term "work for hire," right? So if, if certain under certain conditions, if you uh, uh, um, when if it work for hire, the employer is considered the copyright owner. The the and the, the conditions are, 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 are these. One is you have an employer-employee relationship, which is a legal thing, and depending on a lot of factors. Normally, if you hire someone outside to write music for your show, he's, he's not your employee, per se, because you're not providing his workplace, you don't set his hours, you don't, you, you're paying him by the job, you're not paying him by the hour, you're, you're not providing his tools all those factors, so he's not a, technically an employee. And to be at a work for hire in, in uh, if you're not a, an employee, you can sign a work for hire, but it only applies to certain classes of, of works, audiovisual works being one, meaning movies, television, audiovisual works, Plays and musicals not considered part of it, so, so you would actually need a, a assignment of so so uh, uh, plays and musicals are not one of those works that are you can be a work for hire. You can be an employee if you have a normal employee relationship. Well, okay, so stuff in the public domain is public domain, meaning there is no copyright if if it's in public domain. So 
the Bible is in the public domain, Shakespeare, anything, it, it, to just to be really easy, anything prior to 1923 in the United States is in the public domain. Anything first published prior to 1923 is in the public domain. Um, after 1923, for the most part, it is not. There are conditions where things got thrust in the public domain because they didn't get... Um, didn't get renewed. There was a time when you had to renew the copyright, and if you didn't renew it, if you didn't, there was a time when you had to publish it with a copyright notice. Uh, if you didn't have a notice, it went in the public domain. These are all these all these things rules went away 40 years ago, um, uh, and and so the things from 1923 on those copyrights la from 1923 to 1978, the copyright lasted. 95 now last 95 years um, so in January 1st 2019 we will see the first works go into the public domain in 20 years like nothing has gone in the public domain because they extended it 20 years the, the Sonny Bono Copyright Act and I, they extended it they extended copyright 20 years so there was it was 75 years and they moved it to 95 years and so 1922 everything went public domain 1923 on nothing in the public domain and then January 1st, so a year and a month from now, from today, you'll see that 1923 stuff will go in the public domain. Uh, um, so the question is, so the work, the underlying work is in the public domain, the, but translations have their own copyright. And so that, that would be what was the year the translation was done, and then there's some factors there. I, I mean, but sometimes people think stuff in the public domain. I had a case, there's a... A low budget horror movie called Manos, The Hands of Fate, sort of, yeah. right? Which everyone thought was in the public domain, and um, because the movie was published, they didn't have a copyright notice when it was first released, and you didn't have a copyright, you had to have a copyright notice. And um, I was actually hired by the family to to see if there, if we can get around that. And I found out there was a copy, there was the, the guy who wrote the movie copyrighted the the script to the movie before the movie came out. So yeah, the movie's in the public domain, but the script is not, and if you make, if you do anything with the movie, you're infringing the copyright to the script. So I was able to pull it back out, and it's actually not, it's, it's not. So there are exceptions. It also would be, but it, also the script would have to have been written after 1964, because before 64, they would have had to have been a renewal. They would have had to renew it, and they almost certainly didn't renew it. Right, because there was a period where copyright lasted 28 years, and then you had to renew it after 28 years. And then the, in, seven, in the 70s, they retroactively went back, and so stuff after 64 does not have to be renewed. So stuff from the 50s, you're almost That's certain. Understanding how the movie is, is Same with uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life is in the public domain. The movie's in the public domain, but the underlying story is not, and the music is not because they had separate copyrights. But you could show a clip from the movie and or stills from the movie and that's not copyright infringement because like people say like can I talk about a movie in a in my movie? Can I can I quote? Yes. You can talk about movies in your movies. You can you can um, you can quote lines from movies. You can have a character who says, frankly my dear, I don't give a damn. That's not a copyright infringement. Um, Singing is a little tougher. They're much more strict, mostly because when you're, when you're making the analysis of whether it's a fair use, right? So fair use is not copyright infringement. Uh, the, one of the factors is the amount of the underlying work. So if you're taking one line from a movie or two lines from a movie, it's so small and um, that nobody's going to, right, it's, it's too small to, have to, 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 be, to be considered an infringement. If you're singing two lines from a song, um, well, that, that's a greater, that could be 10% of the song, right? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I mean, I, if you're writing a script and you go, the character sings Stairway to Heaven, and you wrote that in your script, the producer understands that before he makes the movie, he has to go to Led Zeppelin and get the rights. You don't need to worry in your script that you wrote that down, that that's an infringement. Okay, don't, that, don't, let, don't let that scare you. Great question. That's a, so the other thing is, so people are always like, 
Can I use real names of products? Can I show my products in the movies? Yes, 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 you can. You can say, I'm setting this thing in McDonald's. I'm setting this thing. I'm, the character brings out a Coke. Um, now, the, the reason you don't do, like, you'll, now, when they make the movie, they may not. Now, you have to go, uh, is it important that it's a Coke? Is it important? And the reason that you, that, especially on television, you, or the reason pe that you'll see it covered up or not, not used is because the stuff shows up on television. Television is, it's not trademark infringement. It has nothing to do with trademark infringement. The issue is the stuff shows up on television. Television is sponsored by commercials. Pepsi does not want to buy a commercial on a movie where people are drinking Cokes. So for that simple reason, people don't try, people try to obscure stuff because they don't want to get, because down the road they're going to sell it. That's not your concern. If, you know, if, if you're just writing a script and you don't want to say they're, they're drinking a diet soda, <laughs> you know, you want to say Diet Coke, but does it matter? You may, when you get into production on the script, you may go, does it matter? Can it be a Diet Pepsi? I don't care, you know, because we got a sponsorship. Or, you know, he's drinking a Budweiser. Okay, but we got, we got a deal with Michelob. Yeah, I mean, you can, your script can be, um, as specific as you want. I mean, that, you know, in, um, and sometimes, like in uh, Pulp Fiction, uh, Quentin created, you know, Big Kahuna Burger, uh, right? They, they, they have the Big Kahuna Burger and they, and they talk. But they have a whole conversation about Burger King, right? Right? What's a, what, or, right? What's a Whopper with cheese uh, called in France, right? Uh, uh, a quarter pounder with cheese, right? What's a quarter pounder with cheese, right? It's not, it's not because they don't have this metric system, right? It's a whole conversation, right? It's fine. That's, that's, they don't have to. If you've seen uh, Clerks, uh, they have all the conversation about Empire Strikes Back in there. It's perfectly fine to discuss stuff. That's just First Amendment, you're fine. No lawsuits. Don't worry about it. Don't worry if you have a scene in a store. You don't have to cover up all the labels. I, I was, in fact, I was doing a movie. I, a client gave me a bit part in, in their uh, movie, and, um, and one of the actors is wearing, uh, you know, like a, a, a you know, a, a Nike thing, and they're like, oh, you got to cover that up. And I'm like, you don't have to cover up the thing. <laughs> that's, that's what they do on television because of the sponsorship. But we were making a low-budget horror movie. You don't have to worry about that in, in the movie world. You don't have to worry about covering up labels and, and if, if you go, oh, this McDonald's is actually giving people poison, right? They're selling poison burgers. You may have trouble getting financing for that movie. <laughs> but if you go, this stuff is horrible for you, this stuff will kill you because, you know, like this stuff will kill you. Or you're using, you're using poison as a metaphor because it will kill you because McDonald's is bad for you. That's all protected by the First Amendment, right? And so, you know, those are all fine to do. Uh, you know, if that's really the, the point of your movie is to make a statement about McDonald's, you know, at some point you're going to, you may want to talk to a lawyer about what, you know, where you're, to stay away from that lawsuit, but in general, you can make movies where you go, this is horrible. You can talk bad about products because you have a right to do that because the First Amendment says you have a right to say that. If I can say, if I can say McDonald's sucks, they're horrible, they're killing you, why can't I have a character say that in a movie? I could, certainly if I wrote in a book, no one would think twice, right? If I had a character in a book, ranting about McDonald's and how horrible it was, right? You wouldn't go, oh, can he do that? No, because but, but when you put it in a movie, you think, oh my God, I can he, like, there's some different analysis. But analysis is really the same between, you know, book or movie in terms of talking bad about it. Um, so don't, don't worry about that. Writing about real people, writing about your own life or writing about real events. I know, uh, Mitch, you're writing about a real person and, and that, these, are, these are the issues that come up. So if you're writing about your own life, right, you can, so libel, right, you're worried about libel. Um, 
uh, libel is saying false things about, false disparaging things about people, right? If I write, uh, 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 um, uh, Donald Trump is a genius, right? That may be false, <laughs> but it's not disparaging, okay? Maybe false, not disparaging, right? Okay. Um, uh, if, it, you know, if I write, uh, Matt Lauer is sexually harassing employees, right? Disparaging, apparently not false, right? So not, not, I can write, right? So false and disparaging. Now, when you're writing about um, real people, who, it, in, like in famous things, like the OJ, you watched the OJ uh, TV series last year, right? Do you know whose rights they acquired to make that show? Right? Everyone in that show is a real person. Whose rights did they acquire to make that show? The only person's rights that they got for that show was Jeffrey Tubin, who wrote the underlying book that they based it on, and he shows up in one scene of the movie. And Jeffrey Tubin's a right, you know, he's on he's a panelist. All right. So he's the only one whose rights they got. They didn't get Marsha Clark's OJ, Darden, Shapiro, the None, none of them. They didn't clear any of them. They're all, because they sourced it, they're, they're, they're real, they're, they're all famous, they were all famous, um, so public figures. Um, they tried to stick to facts, you know, they, if they said something, you know, OJ is, is libel proof, he's been convicted, I mean, he, he wasn't convicted of the thing, but it, in a civil case, he was, they said he's a murderer, so he, he can't be, he can't be libeled. Cochran is dead, dead people cannot be libeled, so you can write anything you want about people who are dead, uh, anything, uh, because they can't sue you and their family can't sue you. Um, but the only thing I, just be careful, so if you're writing about someone and you go, oh, I'm gonna write about, about uh, I'm going to write about Charlie Manson, right? He was dead anyway. I'll write about the whole thing. Um, but there are people who, who are alive who, but let's say you wrote and said, um, uh, uh, oh, the, the real murderer was not Manson. It was, uh, it was um, uh, LaBianca's son. He was the actual killer, right? Well, he's alive, and he could sue you for that, right? So... Um, when you're writing about real people who are famous, if you're because there's there's two things you're writing either your own personal story. Um, if you're writing your own personal story, then you have to go. It's important that I use the real names because normally it's not. Usually it's not because nobody doesn't know. Nobody knows your. No one knows who you are, right? <laughs> right. Nobody knows you. So if you change the names, it doesn't change the the. Right, it doesn't, to, to the viewer, they don't see it as different. Whereas the OJ show would have been completely different if you didn't use their names, right? The whole point was that it's OJ and Marsha Clark, and that's the whole point. If you're writing about yourself, you can, and you, you're going, oh, I'm going to write about my first girlfriend who cheated on me, and I hate her, I'm going to make her look bad, right? Don't use her name, right? Because no one cares what her name is. Um, the other thing you can do is the, the, this is, this is not really the person you're re thinking you're reading about, which is the Devil Wears Prada version, which is right, like everyone knew that was Anna Wintour, right? Meryl Streep was playing Anna Wintour, but they got, this is not Anna Wintour. This is, yes, she worked at Vogue. Yes, uh, this is something like her. It's not Anna Wintour, and therefore, we're not worried about, th therefore, there was no lawsuit because didn't use her name. There was a case this, this year involving the movie The Hurt Locker. So The Hurt Locker was based on a Rolling Stone article that um, uh, Jeffrey Bolt, I think his name is, the, the screenwriter, uh, did about these uh, people who uh, bombed diffusers in, in Iraq. And um, one of the guys said he is the basis for the Jeremy Renner character and he thought he was defamed. Uh, well, actually, he didn't sue for defamation. He sued for right of publicity. He said, "This is you're making a movie based on my life, and that you can't do." And 
the Ninth Circuit, which is our circuit, said, no, you can. We have a First Amendment right to make movies about people. Um, and so they, they, they said it was okay to do a movie about, even though it was somewhat based on him, and they didn't use his real name. And, and they, but even if they had used his real name, I think the court would have still upheld it. The court has been very, again, we have a very studio-friendly court in the Ninth Circuit, so they've been fairly broad about ma letting you make movies about real people. The re the, so as opposed to, a, there's no right of publicity claim. And um, w so when people say, I want to get the rights to their life, I want to get their life rights, really what they're, they're not actually buying their life rights because I, I don't need anyone's life rights, right? They didn't need OJ's life rights or, or any of those people to make that show. They didn't need it. What they're really buying when you buy someone's life rights is the right not to get sued. That's what you're buying them off. You're saying, I want, I will pay you, and you understand I may, you may be defamed in this thing, and you're not going to sue me for it. Also, if you're making a movie about a, a lovable person, let's, like, let's say Ray, like Ray, right? Uh, um, you don't want that person um, bad talking. Bad the, the project, you want him on board. I think Ray was still alive when the movie came out, right? It was just before he died, right? You, don't, you wouldn't want to make a movie about, I mean, obviously they needed his permission because they needed the music, um, and he owned, the, he owned his music. But let's say you're making a movie about someone like that, and, you, and you, you, you're really buying his goodwill. You're, you're saying, I will pay you money, you will come to the premiere, you will talk good about this movie, that's what you're buying. You're not actually buying their life rights because you, you don't need to. I, I'll go to title. I'll talk a little bit about titles um, because people are always asking me about can, can I use this title or not. Um, and my general rule is uh, people worry way too much about titles. Um, uh, as a general rule, titles of a single work are not uh, trademarkable. They're not protectable. And so you can use... You'll see, if you look on IMDb and put in a title you'll see that there are four or five other movies that already have that title. So, uh, other, you know, there are movies that where there's a series, if you have a series of movies, Harry Potter, Star Wars, um, Friday the 13th, right, then you can have a trademark on that, and then you can stop other people from coming out with movies um, with that title. Um, but otherwise, um, and, and there's another thing. So if you're a playwright, it's a different thing because you're, you're writing a play and you sort of know whether what the, the, the title of the play you want is and you get to control that. If you're writing a movie, you don't get to control what the title is. You, you can put the title on the script, but that's not going to be the title <laughs> of the movie they're, because even though titles are not protectable, the studios have their own internal title protection system. And they have their own registry, which is just for the studios and for members of the Producers Guild. And they register their own. It's a, it's a self-contained thing. It's not public. It's only for the people who are involved there. And so if you name it something, you won't even know that it, oh, it, it's on some list somewhere, and they're going to change it. So what you need to do when you're writing, if you're writing a, a script and you want to sell that script, you have to think about who your audience is and who you're writing that title for. The title is not for the audience member, right? The title, who's the title for? The producer. The producer. When, you ever see the movie American Pie? Okay. When American Pie was written and went out, it was not called American Pie. It was called, and I'm not kidding, this was the title on it, untitled teenage sex comedy that could be made for under $10 million that most readers will probably hate, but I think you will love. <laughs> that is genius. Genius. They understood their audience. I'm writing a title for the producer. I'm not thinking about, I don't, this is not what the, this is not what the, the audience is going to see. It's not going to show up on a marquee. It's just for someone to go, oh, 
what is the title that when a, when a re reader has five scripts that he has to take home to read over the weekend, which is the one that he's going to pick first? So that's the title you want to put. That's the title you want. It's something that it, it, it piques their interest. And you can, you can be free, right? This, this American Pie shows you there is no limit to what you can or cannot put on a title. You can put whatever you want. Get that, you know, so be creative. This is where you can really be creative. Don't, don't, don't think about, you know, I mean, well, they thought Star Wars was a horrible title. So, um, and it, as a matter of fact, because, you know, we saw Star Wars, we all know it's Star Wars, but that movie's no longer called Star Wars. It's called A New Hope. If you go to the thing, it's called A New Hope. Why? Because they wanted to call the whole series Star Wars. They, the only way to, way to get a trademark on it was to call the series Star Wars. So they had to stop calling that one movie Star Wars, the, four, you know, the, the first movie or the, you know, the, the 77 movie, and that's called A New Hope now so they could get the trademark. And the Star Wars is what the whole universe is called now. So... Um, Yeah, no, there, there, there are no protection for songs at all. There's a million, there's just not any song. That, there's not some other song. I mean, in fact, um, uh, Bruno Mars had a hit song, Just the Way You Are, right? That's a, which is a Billy Joel song, which is a big hit, right? This, there's no, people understand I'm buying, the, they don't confuse the Billy Joel, Just the Way You Are, with the Bruno Mars, Just the Way You Are. They understand they're, they're different things. So, yeah, there's no protection for for titles. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm going to leave you with one uh, book recommendation, uh, which is a book I read a long time ago, but it's become much more uh, important now, which is a book called Down and Dirty Pictures by Peter Biskin. Peter with, Biskin. Yeah, B-I-S-K-I-N, yeah, B-I-S-K-I-N-D. It's the story of uh, uh, Sundance, the Sundance Film Festival, and um, Miramax Pictures, and what I, I and I've for ten years I've been telling people to read this book because what it's about is about how the Weinstein's were screwing over every writer and r director who worked for them. And so when people go, "Did you know about Harvey?" I go, "I didn't know about the sex stuff, but I knew he would screw you over." Yeah. I mean, it was not a secret. Like this book, like is just all about like that stuff. So it's kind of interesting. Like oh, down, and dirty. down and dirty pictures. Anyway, it's a, it's a really, it's a really, and like you go, so when people go, like, am I going to get screwed over uh, by the studios? Yes, you will get screwed over by the studios. I mean, this is, this is um, why you, I mean, I always try to get my clients money up front. Um, I just uh, had a client did a horror movie with, with Weinstein um, four years ago, and the, like, this, they had a fee. They were getting, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars for the, for the producer fee. And they came to him right before and said, you know what, we, we, need, we need more money, so you have to take less fee, and we'll give you more back end. And he, you know, he turned to me and said, should, should I do that? I go, no, <laughs> no. Just, they will make the movie anyway. They're full of crap. Get, you know, um, they wanted to cut their fee in half. Um, uh, they, uh, so we, we, we said, no, we, we want our whole fee. If you're not going to make the movie, don't make the movie. They made the movie. They paid them the whole fee. The movie sat on the shelf for four years. Uh, it, they just released it, went straight to video, made no profit. It's called, uh, uh, it was the new Amityville Horror. It was an Amityville Horror sequel. Um, anyway, so it was like, 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 get your money up front because there is no back end. <laughs> so, um, well, that's why I'm not a big fan. I mean, I don't say put your script out so anyone can see it. I mean, that's, that's, there are people who put it on, there are these script things, Script Shark and other places where you can post your script and people can read it. And I guess they have success stories. I don't know anyone personally who's thing. I mean, but, you're running that risk. It's it's a it's a it's a you know. On the other hand, it's so it's not the first place I'd put my script. I mean, I always say you want it. What you want to do is get an agent. I know how hard it is to get an agent, but you want to get an, you want to get an agent. You want to get them out there trying to, trying to do that. Um, but 
you know, if you have nothing else to do with it, if it's not, if it's just going to sit in a drawer, fine, put it out there. I, I mean, I have people who call me and they go, you know, oh my God, I can't, I can't, put, I can't get, like they're so worried about it being stolen, they won't give it to anybody. Well, I mean, well, it doesn't do you any good in your drawer. So, you know, if, it, if, 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 you know, I mean, Twilight was fan fiction, right? She wrote that as fan fiction. It was just on a fan fiction site for, uh, not, twi not Twilight, Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey was Twilight fan fiction. It originally was the characters from Twilight, right? It was vampires. And then it was so, people liked it so much, she, she said, fine, I'm just going to take it and remove the vampires and make it S&M. And it was the best-selling book of the three years in a row, right? I mean, it's like an amazing story. So, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, so, so, you know, there, there are success stories from putting your stuff online, people, if people like it, you know. Uh, but register with the Copyright Office and, you know, do what you can. All right. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, yeah.